There are mysteries in this world that I just don't understand, and I don't expect that I ever will. For example, I don't understand unconditional love. I have trouble grasping the concept of a God who loves everyone with no strings attached. God loves me as well as those who call me an abomination and would rather I didn't exist. God loves Nidal Hassan as much as the 13 soldiers that he killed at Fort Hood. God loves Mother Teresa and Fred Phelps. Unconditional love is a mystery to me. And death and the afterlife. What exactly happens after we die is another mystery to me. What is heaven really like? Are we reunited with all of our loved ones? And how can a loving God send people to hell? And will all of our questions really be answered when we die? And then there's prayer. For me, it's one of the biggest mysteries of all. I don't understand all there is to understand about prayer. I can't tell you why God seems to answer the prayers of some people and not those of others. I don't know if God is more likely to answer a prayer that is spoken by many people than the prayer that comes from a single pair of lips. And more times than not, I don't even know what I'm supposed to be praying about. Should I pray for a change in events or for acceptance of the current circumstances? I don't have all the answers, but I've got my own beliefs about prayer just like all of you. Beliefs that are drawn from the Bible and from my own experiences. And this morning's example of Hannah found in the first chapter of the book of 1 Samuel support those beliefs. So let me share a few of them with you. I believe that God is a God of grace and mercy and justice and love. I believe that those are some very defining characteristics of the God that I worship. And if that is so, then even when I am unsure of what's the right thing to pray for, I can always pray that I would be an instrument of God's grace, mercy, justice, and love. And I can pray that God would reveal those things in my life and in the lives of others. When we find Hannah praying in this morning's text, that's what her prayer is really about. Hannah was being oppressed by Panina. To the casual observer of our 21st century, we may see it less as oppression than as a petty and ongoing argument between two women. Not much different than the drama we would find on any television soap opera. But if we understand that during that day and age, approximately 1,000 years before Christ was born, a woman's value, her worth, depended upon her ability to bear children, then we can see Hannah as someone who, who was being shut out and shut down by the other wife. She was denigrated and treated as less than. And so if we recognize these things about her, then we see Hannah's prayer less as a prayer for a baby boy and more for God's mercy and justice to prevail in her life. In the next chapter, she praises God as the one who raises up the poor from the dust, who lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with royalty and inherit a seat of honor. Hannah saw God as the great equalizer, and she called upon that part of God to be revealed in her life. 
when i pray i can usually feel safe in praying for justice to prevail for pain to be removed for grace and mercy to be revealed in everyday life this morning's story implies that god's will is for liberty and justice for all not just the few but as i look at hannah in the prayer that she lifted up to god i can't ignore what might also be called her her prayer environment now i know that we can communicate with god throughout the day i believe that we can indeed toss up a prayer to god while we're driving down the road washing the dishes or standing in line at the grocery store I also believe we can communicate with each other with email through Facebook by text messaging or by leaving a phone message on an answering machine and yet no matter how convenient it may be within our fast-paced lives to take advantage of these methods of communication they don't really compare with a person-to-person -person leisurely conversation maybe over coffee or a meal as advanced as technology may be there's nothing like spending some quality time with someone we care about I also believe that an effective prayer life depends upon our setting aside quality time and space for God that probably means turning off the cell phone and television and putting away the iPod it will mean focusing our conversation and time with God on God and putting our multitasking skills aside for a moment. Today's text says that Hannah rose and presented herself before God. She went to the temple. She removed herself from her everyday world and stepped into a prayer space. Jesus would often do the same thing, going away from the crowds and his own disciples to pray. They often had to track him down, usually up on a mountain, if they wanted to find him. I believe the quality of prayer is enhanced when we can stop and take a breather. I believe we are much more inclined to hear God's answer to our prayers. When our attention is not divided between God and the other activities of our lives. What that looks like is different for different people. How we go about creating a sacred space and time for God is unique for each of us. But I believe it needs to happen if we're going to experience the full benefits of prayer.